and rose again. Everybody was held captive in the earth. So Jesus came to give us a rescue program. What did we do? This is what human beings did. Don't get mad at me. We made it a religion. God sent a rescue program, sent his own son to die in our place, to exchange, pay, redeem us. Can you say amen? He paid for us in full. Glory to God. So therefore, everything that we've ever done, ever could do wrong, is all covered. And no longer are we sinners saved by grace. We are children of God. And therefore, we have a different set of rules. You don't throw your child out onto the street and give him a big kick and say, hey, you pooped your pants, you're never coming back in this house again. Well, we treat God in the New Testament that way. We think if we make mistake, God leaves us. When he says, I shall never leave you, I shall never forsake you, I won't even disappoint you. God is perfect, always perfect concerning you and good. So where's all this junk coming from? It's coming from religious teachings. It's coming from the enemy. Enemy loves to create division. Hello? Take a look at the, our lovely nation the last few years. Satan did that, and people listened to him. How do you know people are listening to him? Because people that listen to the devil, the devil is crazy. And when people listen to the devil who's crazy, they do crazy things. Pretty simple. Jesus said, be careful who you hang around. Paul says, watch the company you keep. <laughs> We're supposed to be influencing the world. Can you say amen? Not letting the world influence us. Hello. You go out with your friends, do you compromise? Or do you stand up and be their testimony? We, we should. Someone say amen. All right. We've been studying new creation realities. And this one is called understanding authority. I believe in my heart that many Christians don't understand how authority works. And, you know, the original thing is God has given mankind authority in the earth. Hello. We're going to see that. God has given us a birthright, being human. Now, let me answer another question. We're only a little over 6,000 years old as Homo sapiens sapiens. Here we go. I'm going to douse you with a little science, okay? We are only a little over 6,000 years old, okay? So, where did all that junk out there that's thousands and thousands of years come from? Have you ever heard of the devil? He was on this planet before Adam and Eve. And he was in the garden. And he did all those things hoping to get the planet from God. But Jesus came to rescue us because he lost us in Adam. Now, let's get into this. This is going to be really good. I hope I don't lose you. Now, I preach the whole gospel. I don't preach just religious. Did you know religion can blind us? If people don't feel comfortable with what they understand to be the truth, often religion will hold them to go any further. And we don't want to be bound by our religious beliefs. We want to be free by the Spirit of God. Can you say amen? And God's word is clear in the word. You have an Old Testament. You have a New Testament. Are you still with me? So God gave mankind authority and gave him this planet. We're going to see that. So would you take your Bible and go with me to Genesis chapter 1. The word Genesis means a book of beginnings. Things begin here. So it's a great place to go back and look at some things. So in Genesis, it's really exciting, okay? Now, in order for us to understand authority, we have to... Take a look at a couple of things. Now, let me ask you, does God back his word? Yes. yes, he does. So he will always back his word concerning you. But you want to make sure it's his word and not something that sounds like his word. So God backs his word, ultimate authority. Can you say amen? In fact, I think it's 100, uh, Psalms 138 verse 2, where God honors his word above his name. And you know how God holds his name high. He honors his word. So if God gives his word, he will honor that by keeping it. Can you say amen? So who's the ultimate authority everywhere? God is. Let me break God down for you. God is three persons in one 
corporate expression. God is three persons in one, one in three persons. Can you say amen? Now, you hear the word army. That's a plural word. Army is a plural word. But if it says army, it's a singular plural word. So for us to understand that God is three persons but works in absolute harmony, we should understand that above everything. Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. Can you say amen? Now, there's a lot of bad teaching out there in, in the world. You watch ancient aliens and all that kind of stuff. Just switch, switch the aliens from aliens to fallen angels, and you'll get the message, okay? Uh, those are fallen angels. Those are not other people visiting our planet. So back to God. God's in three persons, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, right? Everyone say, got it? And then what happened to the word? The word came to where we were. The word became flesh. Now it's the father, the son, the begotten son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. Can you say amen? Now what do you mean begotten son? Jesus always was. He was the word. The father always was. He is almighty God. And the Holy Spirit always are. These three make God, the God that we serve. Elohim. Everyone say Elohim. Elohim. Not your neighbor him. No, Elohim. Elohim is the highest description of the first three that created everything. So if you can imagine the first three Elohim, Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit... They made everything, and they made everything good, right? Okay, so who was the first one that created sin? Satan did. God did not create the devil to be the devil. He created the devil to be absolutely perfect, but Satan got into himself. If you read accounts in Ezekiel 3rd, uh, 28 and Isaiah 14. He got so full of himself, he decided he was going to declare war against God. How stupid is that? All right, now you got it. So there's three that bear record in heaven the Father, the Word. Now the Word has become flesh. It's dwell among us. It's written about. We have the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart. Amen. So we are under the authority of Almighty God. Say amen. amen. Now there's one part of you that does not want to be under the authority of God. It's because it has a nature in it that fights against us. That's your flesh. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, I don't see you anymore in the flesh. No. <laughs> we dwell in a nurse suit. I call it a nurse suit. We dwell in the flesh. Now your flesh, now listen to me, has to be cleansed by God every day. It has to be. Otherwise, it emanates the nature of the enemy out of us. Now, who came into Adam's life when Adam committed sin? The devil, didn't he? So his nature came into Adam. This is what Christians don't understand. That's why we age in our flesh. That's why we get sick and break down. Because there's a nature of the fallen ones in our flesh. Now, what's the one thing of your spirit, soul, and body you're not taking to heaven? Your flesh! <laughs> God changes it. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, when we get ready to go or when we die, when he raises us up, he gives us a new created, same body, but no more curse in it. No more the devil's nature in it. So when you see the word S-I-N in the Bible, it means the nature of the devil. Okay? If you see the S-I-N-S, that means what we do because of that nature. We were sinners, folks. Because the nature of sin was in our flesh. But when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God not only came into our heart, but says if we walk in the light, even, even as children, his blood is constantly reapplied to us so that God can keep us in fellowship. Hello? Do you think the devil fellowships with, um, excuse me, God fellowships with the devil? No. So when you're a Christian and you're walking around in the natural all the time, and you're not subjecting yourself to God, getting under his authority, God can't fellowship with you because your very flesh repels him. 
All your pride, all our, how many know God resists the proud and give grace to the humble? All our human pride is in the flesh. Our mind has some of it, but you know, your mind's not very powerful. Here, let me, sh- let me show you. Can you feel anything? <laughs> it's the verbal bringing forth of God that moves the covenant. Can you say amen? Of course you can't. So your mind has good and bad in it. We got to wash our mind. Get a chance. Come Wednesday night to our study. We're teaching on the renewal of the mind. It's really, really good. It's going to, it's deep and it'll help you, Lord, begin to uh, help us with the Lord to begin to sort out what's not working in our life. Now, stick with me. So God is perfect. Can you say amen? And his dealings with us are perfect. Can you say amen? So now we need to understand how authority operates. All right, everyone, did you get to Genesis? Okay. Book of beginnings, look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Who's he talking to? Let us make man. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or the Father, Word, and the Holy Spirit. He's not talking to a bunch of angels and say, hey, buddies. We're going to put together a man. There's a bunch of people preaching right now that's, that say the teachings of the Samaritans and the Anunnaki, bless their darn little pick and fallen hearts, say that the Bible was borrowed from the writings of the tablets. No, no. The Anunnaki are the fallen beings that lie and corrupted this planet. They have never left. They're still here. And they're still corrupting everybody. Take a look at the world. But we're following who? Jesus Christ. That's why you need to meet with them, be with them, so that you'll be accurate in your walk. And it isn't a come see some saw walk. Amen. So God said, let us make man in our image. He's talking to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. According to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing, that's the devil too, that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And now listen to the next phrase, and subdue it. We forget that and subdue it. Wait a minute. Subdue what? There's an outlaw in the planet. His name is Satan. He's a serpent. He's a fallen cherubim. Adam's job was to put that creature in his place and to reign and rule in the earth. But we find him following his wife, serving the created one more than the creator, didn't obey God, didn't put his foot down, and the devil's talking to his wife. How many guys you know have the devil talking to your wife? (laughs) Let's hope not. And when Satan came, notice he came to the one who had an indirect fellowship and not to the one who had a direct fellowship. Adam had a direct fellowship with God and Eve had an indirect fellowship through her husband about God. Don't you run on a relationship through someone else. You run on a direct relationship with God yourself. Can you say a personal relationship? Amen. So you can see right here, God put man in control of the earth, didn't he? Do you see it? And subdue it and replenish the earth. Amen? Hew it, take care of it. And it says that when God was done, after he had made man and all the things in there, he says not only was it good, he said it was very good. So where did the problem come? The problem came through a jealous fallen cherubim and a bunch of his creations got into the garden because Adam didn't rebuke him at the edge of the garden. And he got snuck in while he was following his wife and she must have been gorgeous. Come on now, I'm just being real with you. And he must have been gorgeous. So naturally, he's following behind her. You can laugh at that. And then she's talking to the devil, and and Adam's standing right there with her. I love this for the camera, and my my relatives and all these people are watching too. Bless you. 
You, you know I ham it up a lot. So anyway, so, and, and the devil says, oh, God didn't really say, God didn't really do that. Now, what you really don't know, and I'm going to say it again, there was something wrong with that tree. If you believe that God put every tree in the garden, then why would he poison his children? The Bible says, let no man say that God will tempt anyone. So something went boo-boo in the garden there. And I'll tell you exactly what happened, whether you want to believe this or not. Satan messed with the tree. He set the tree at odds because it was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Does good agree with evil? Does evil agree with good? So when they ate of it, they became contrary to themselves. Listen to me good. You cannot do the things that you wish if you're vacillating from your flesh to your spirit, your spirit to your flesh. It says in Galatians chapter 5, it says, walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary. See, so what Satan did is he poisoned mankind. So we, we actually argue with ourselves. Look at yourself and say, I'm my own best friend. You know it's true. And how easy is it to find an argument between Christians? Hi, hi what's your favorite baseball team? What's your favorite? We must use football. What's your football? Oh, yeah, well, I don't like them. Now we've got indifference. What does Satan feed on? Indifference. Listen, I don't care what team you love. I'm going to love them with you. Glory to God. I might not agree with everything, but I'm certainly not going to stir up division. Can you say amen? So we're going to get into, into some powerful things. So what did Satan do? He usurped Adam's birthright. He came in, commanded them. They ate of the tree and were poisoned. That's why your flesh can't go. If your flesh was fully redeemable, then God wouldn't have to change it. Okay? So what we do is we bring it to the, the cleaners. Every day we go before God, have God zap it so it's not offensive to him. And we can walk in the spirit through the day. You see, I'm not serving God in my natural man. I will fall on my face all the time. I'm serving God from my spirit man out of the inside. I'm walking now. Now listen, you are too. From the inside out and not from the outside in. When I was a sinner, well, I went by my emotions and what felt good, do it. And I almost got killed many times. You know, drummer in a rock and roll band. There's two strikes against me. Anyway, you can't really do anything. Satan put his nature in human flesh now. So that's why it says, if you walk in the flesh, you will not please God. It says, the natural man receives not the things which are of the spirit, for they are foolishness to him. Spirit to spirit, not spirit to intellect. Hello? You're not that smart. You notice God didn't say, hey, tell me the answer to this. <laughs> Come on. Let's remember we're sheep. It, that's a kind of a humorous thing. Sheep are not very intelligent. They need someone to guide them. And let's be honest. Man, I'm better off being guided by God than being guided by myself. Amen. And when, when I stand up here, it's the spirit of God standing up here. And not just carry. Because if I just gave you my opinion, we would all could go home. <laughs> Amen. So basically, we have authority. Now, Satan took that authority. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to go through this. We're going to have fun, okay? We will cover understanding our authority. Number one, we'll cover this. To have authority, a person must be born again or born here. Can you say amen? If you're going to have any say in the earth, you must be born here. Let me ask you something. Was Satan born here? No, he's a created being. He doesn't have a belly button. <laughs> Neither did Adam and Eve. But anyway, thought that extra thing for Sunday school. Okay? He wasn't born here. So Satan had no say here. So when God put his man on in the earth, man had the say. But Satan went right in and usurped authority, usurping authority. Hello. 
Your foot doesn't tell your head how to think. Hello? Hello? So he went in there and he severed the whole thing from God. Now God can't... See, once God sets something in motion, he can't annihilate it. Man is an eternal being. So we're going to live eternally one place or the other. So once we're set in motion through Adam, now God has to come with a rescue plan to get us out of Satan's nature. Can you say amen? amen? But we still had authority until Satan took it from Adam. So now we can see why the earth got so bad in Genesis chapter 8. It says there were only eight righteous left on the entire planet. No one is family. There wasn't one savable person on the planet other than those eight. And one was pretty iffy. She was married to one of the boys. Hello? You guys didn't know that. That's why you, we need to study. I'm not going to try to tell you everything. So that's how bad Satan had corrupted the earth. Now, take a look around you just briefly. I don't want you to just hang there. How much he's corrupted this earth. He's wiggled his way into our schools. He's trying to get into our government. He's trying to get into our, trying to remove everything that has to do with authority. Did you notice that? Anybody that knew anything is trying to be, you know, debunked. Any Christian churches right now, they got Satanism people going into churches. Oh, have you seen? Oh, I've dealt with them. I work with the police department in, in Buckley and Enumclaw, wiping out satanic covens. Someday we'll sit down and talk. And we'll chew the cud there and share about what God is doing in our life. Yes, and they will send people in to create division and arguments. And I said this, and next thing you know, Satan's just feeding. Because he feeds on strife and hurt and pain, wars rumors he feeds on that why do you think the world is full of that atmosphere i know what peggy asked me one time right peggy she says why are they talking so much about global warming this is a joke but it's real because serpents need it warm <laughs> it's not a global warming and there's not a global cooling it's just the earth can you say amen? And we're the newest people on the earth. We're only a little over 6,000 years old. <laughs> so what was going on before we were put in here? That will be for another Bible study. And I have plenty of teaching on that. If you'd like to hang out after church, we've got some video clips, some things I'd like to show with you guys and educate you. But you know what? We only have so much time in the day and some of you are real busy. All right. So we're going to cover... Authority, being born again. Uh, we're going to cover the second thing is the serpent stole Adam's authority. We're going to show you how. And then third thing we'll cover is Jesus gained it back by defeating the enemy. How many say amen? And fourthly, Jesus turned that victory over to you and I. Everyone say, it is finished. Now, who said that? What does that mean? When he was hanging on the cross, he hadn't even gone to hell, haven't even dealt with the devil yet. He said, it is finished. In other words, Jesus fulfilled everything that was necessary to free you and I out of our sin and the grip of Satan. It is finished. If we'll put our faith in him, then the battle's over. We already arrived home in Christ. Say amen. Now, we still are here. And we still, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves in some battles. And that's because it's usually a deception that God is there. Go over here sometime when you and God are sitting together and say, how many of the problems that I've had have been a result of me? And how much has been the result of the devil? And you'll find us, and God, you know what he said to me? This is what he said to me. He says, son, the devil can't do anything you don't let him get. He needs you to believe in what he's saying to you, to yield to that so he can do something. He says, if you're so caught up in me, son, you won't have time to listen to a liar. In fact, it's written, a stranger's voice we will not follow. Hello? 
Don't you like all those scriptures coming together and just telling us all the same story? It's all the same story. It's the good news of what Jesus Christ did for you and I and that we are in the rescue program and our job is to go out and rescue other people who need to have the truth. You see, we have nothing for anyone to join here. See? But we want you to join yourself with Christ and, and if you need to know the truth, you're going to get it here. There's other great churches too. But get the word. It's the word. Because that word has been hidden from us, folks. Satan has worked hard to replace the word with religious thought. For example, here's one. Well, God is putting me through hard times, Sherry. Just to show me something. I don't know what it is, but I on the other end, I'm going to know what God is trying to show me. Now, is that God? No. That's the devil, because he runs by a carrot, drifted in front of your nose. God does not punish his children if he's dwelling in them. Here, let me slap myself. <laughs> unstable God is unstable in all his ways. Double-minded God. Hello. See, we, we wrestle between Old Testament and New Testament, and we mix them all up. And we come up with this thing called the gospel. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. That's a bunch of bunk. The Bible says meet with God, and he'll show you things that come. The problem with a lot of the world is they're going everywhere but God. They'll go, try to read their fortune. They'll go into the notice horror scopes, try to figure out what this week's going to bring. That's people curious in them to want to know what the future's going to hold. Well, God holds your future. You want to know what his perfect plan is for your future? It's all good, but you got to get with God. Yeah, don't get with me. <laughs> I can only share a few things. Get with God and let God unveil to you what he promised. I will show you things that come. I will declare those things unto you. Uh, excuse me, Matthew 16. All right, so let's go to our first point. Man was given authority here because the earth was made for man. Now, folks, people don't realize this is the only planet that is like it. Now, there are other planets that are similar we're discovering them. But this is the planet we live on. So this is what is important. This is the property we're on. So what's happening out there is really, it's tremendous and wonderful. But, but it's what's happening on this planet. Hello. Now you and I have accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So we have actually been sealed. The Bible says we have been given a guarantee, a seal of the Holy Spirit, which says you belong to God. Hello. And that seal will never come off of you, even if you're acting like a jerk. Because God put it on you. You didn't put it on you. It's not by your works, not by your goodness. It's by the mercy of God. He puts a mark on you saying, ah, that person belongs to me. Seth belongs to me. Terry belongs to me. BJ belongs to me. And you've got a mark on you that only the devil can see and only God can see. Yes. Another thing, the Bible tells us that we walk in the light. The light that God is expressing is called illuminas. Illuminas has so many spectrums of light in it. We are only used to seven spectrums of light. Light to light to see, there's x-rays, there's certain gamma rays and all that. But God has a light that only the devil can see. And it's a very frightening light. Because it was the hand and the light of God that threw Satan out of heaven. So when we clothe ourselves in Christ, when we meet with Christ daily and pray, we get clothed in light. Now, what does darkness do when it sees the light? It runs. Now, let me ask you, what's the speed of darkness? It doesn't have a speed. It just hangs there. So if you do nothing, you're going to have a bunch of darkness hanging around you. No, you get active. You pray. You worship. You laugh. You enjoy your life. Just being ready. But meet with God so he clothes you with light, clothes you with himself. And when Satan sees you coming, he doesn't see you. He sees the light and he runs. When light 
comes into darkness, darkness flees at 186,000 miles per second. Hello? God gave us that illustration to show you how weak Satan really is if you walk in the spirit. Now, does God worry about the devil? Is God living in you? So, so why are we concerned so much? Because we're living up here and not enough down in, in the God part. Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. You've got to be taught and trained how to walk right. It is fun. Miracles, signs, and wonders. God told me, if you'll just do what I tell you, for, for a short time, you'll see all kinds of my hands and my handiwork. You just follow me. You're not doing it. Remember, I get all the credit. And I said, yeah, Lord. And then it got to a place where, did you know, we have four seasons as a Christian we go through. This is no extra charge. You have a spring, summer, I don't like the word fall, autumn, and winter. My doctor always says, have you fallen? <laughs> no, sorry. I, I was a fallen, but now I'm a saved. <laughs> anyway, there are times when things are springing forth. Ideas are coming. That's the spring of God's creativity in your life. Then you go into summer where God's producing fruit and things are going to happen. Then all of a sudden, it just seems like you didn't do anything wrong. Everything quiets down. Did I grieve God? No, you're moving into autumn. What does autumn do? All the outward expressions move to the inner recalculations. God is working on the inside of you. You have more fruit to come. So the seasons are set up for the fruit producing. Well, God's season in a believer's life are set up for you to produce more fruit. Go back to the vine. You are the branches. Branch in me that bears fruit. God prunes it so it bears more fruit. Pruning, we always think pruning is God's going to slap us around, Seth. No, straighten up, son. <laughs> no, no. The way, how many here say this with me? I would like to know how God corrects me. Say it. I would like to know how God corrects me. By speaking in your heart. By sharing his word. God never chews you out in front of anybody. He might be stern with you sometimes. When he's stern with me, you know what he does? Carrie, what are you doing? <laughs> That's enough to make me weep. That he would call me by my name and ask me what I'm doing. Because I know I'm messing up somewhere. Hello. God wants to be personal now. But we make him religious. No. So you ask God, peel off that religion out of me. Okay, so we know that Adam was given absolute authority. Listen to this scripture. This is a one in Hebrews. Now, Hebrews has been a hard book for a lot of Christians, but it really isn't that hard. You just got to understand Jewish thought, okay? So let's go to Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 2. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures about God giving this planet to Adam, okay? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And it says, For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels. So this world was never made for angels. It was made for who? Mankind. Mankind. I don't care what you hear anybody saying. God made this planet and had it groomed and set for his man. Read, it's all through the scripture. Not to make us anything special. God did, did that. Gosh, if I was a, a, made a certain way, I'm not going to argue with God. He made you very special, made in his image after his likeness. And Satan says, I'm, that's a mess. I'm going to mess that right up. And there are a lot of Christians, you can't tell the difference between them and the world because they're living for God in their flesh. And God says, I can't even receive that. I love you and I, I appreciate it, but you've got to come to the end of yourself so I can work with the real you and make you into something. Someone say amen. amen. Yeah, we don't make ourselves into somebody. God does that. And the quicker you learn that you already are someone, the quicker you stop trying to impress people. Notice I'm going to stand and just stare. 
See, you already are somebody very special to God. But you don't see that. See, it's hid that from you. And when you see yourself something special, then you enjoy God by being special. But if you think you have to gain people's love and care and everything, now you're in a works program and you're hindering grace from working in you. And then if anything fails, you'll take it harshly because you're doing the work. And we don't mean to do that. We're just being deceived. We've got to come to the end of ourselves, find out what God really wants and go after it. And he says, look, you're not going to do it by yourself. I'm going to work with you. I can do above and beyond anything you can ask or think. So start thinking above. Come on, people, say amen. So for he did not put the world to come as he speak in subjection to angels. And he's talking about Lucifer there. But to what he testified in a certain place, what is man that you are mindful of him? On the son of man, okay, that you are take care of him. Notice you don't see any capitals there. He's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about Adam. Adam and mankind right there, okay? He did not give the world to the angels. Satan thought he, that this was going to be his world. That's why he got jealous and he declared war against God. And he got thrown out of heaven. But, but God made the planet for man, and he says it right here. The son of man, son of man, little s, son of man, Adam. Now, folks, you don't realize that Adam was made in God's likeness. God is light. Adam had a complete body of light. So did Eve, completely. They were light beings made in God's image after God's likeness. But when we fell, we became sensual, sense-ruled beings, ruled by our flesh, feelings, nothing more than feelings. And I got them on my shirt sleeve, so you watch out what you say to me. You see what I mean? So it goes on. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you are take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. How many here know that we're not as strong as angels? But we're more glorious than an angel. And you have crowned him, little h, with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. There we go, Genesis chapter 1. You have authority over this planet in Christ now. So let me say it real quickly. When Adam was created, they had authority. Adam actually named things, declared things. He could actually fellowship on the level of God. He wasn't a God, but he could fellowship. That means God could pick him up in one of his deals and take him wherever he wanted to go, kind of like Enoch. Hello. That's real, by the way. Ezekiel was another one. Elijah was another one up in the fire. Anyway, get all besides that. This earth belongs to mankind. Satan stole it. Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute. But Jesus gained it back. Can you say amen? Now only the humans that accept Christ get their birthright back. The other ones, they have authority, but their birthright, they have no idea. Did you know being born in this planet gives you the right to resist evil? Just that. Just that. And now you have God in you. Whoa. So we have a birthright, now you have a rebirth right. Can you say amen? You have one kingdom of the earth, you have another kingdom of God. And you're right in the center of that. And you want to say, gosh, I hope it's going to be a good day tomorrow. <laughs> uh, do you love me? Yeah. All right. Don't let anybody throw anything at you. <laughs> Just keep it. No, no. Keep it, because he'll, he'll give him too much attention. You want to give him attention. <laughs> now you're between two. Didn't I fix you up really good? <laughs> listen, listen to me. You guys are so, God loves you so much. I, I, I esteem you very highly. So what I'm about to share with you, take notes, okay? We haven't even got into this study yet. You're kidding. Most churches are dead by now. That's why everybody's so carnal. 
and will get anything to chew on during the day. All right, so let's go into this, okay? So notice he gave the earth and the works of his hands over to who? Adam. And he's put all things subjected under his feet. Let's go to my next point. My next point is the serpent stole it from Adam. How do you know that, Pastor Kerry? Well, let's look at these scriptures. The devil stole Adam's birthright. Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Oh, oh, we're in the Old Testament. It's wonderful. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, look at verse 6 and 7 says this. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. Remember the story? This is where everybody mis was mistaught. And that God said to Satan, go ahead and afflict Job. He'll teach, you, teach him to love you better. God had never said, now listen to me. God never said, I give you Job tormentum. Some translations say that, no. God said, have you thought about my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. If you look up the word consider or thought about, it means in the Hebrew, have you set your eyes on to devour him? And Satan comes back and he says, well, you got to hedge about him. And God says, no, he's already in your power. In other words, he's doing things that open up great big doors for you to come in and slap him. But you're too stupid to catch those doors, Satan. Go back and look. So Satan went back down and he looked and Job had some problems. Do you remember the story of Job? The, the book of Job only deals with about six to nine months of Job's life. That's all. It's the oldest book in the Bible of the account of the rolls of scrolls. But it's only dealing with six to nine months of his life. Whoa. You, see, it's good to study the Bible. So he went through hell and back in those six months. Well, what was he doing to cause the devil to afflict him? Number one, he wasn't sacrificing for his children and his folks in faith. He was doing it out of fear. For he said, that thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. How did he fear? Greatly. Fear attracts the devil, just like steak does a rabbit dog. You're going to produce fear and be afraid. You're going to attract the devil because that's his nature. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a? Sound. Amen. Sound. Solid. And it becomes solid by meeting with God. So how did Satan, here's one for you. If God threw Satan out of heaven, when did, it, when did God throw Satan out of heaven? Come on, folks. Before the creation of Adam and Eve, right? He was already the devil during, after Adam and Eve were created, wasn't he? So he was thrown out of heaven sometime before Adam and Eve were created. And you can read about it, like all kinds of teaching if you want to look at what the scripture actually says. You know, this is all scripture. So that means, you think about it, Satan needs to get Adam's birthright from him, right? So let's look at this. I want to break it down for you. Okay, so how did Satan get back up into the throne room of God if God threw him out of there? God threw Satan out of heaven on this planet. But now we see him back up before the throne. How did he get up there? He took the elevator. <laughs> he took the elevator of Adam's authority, his birthright, and went back up to God. That's why God says, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm walking to and fro in the earth. That I, I took from Adam, that lazy bum. <laughs> That's Satan's words, okay? Hello. And then if you read chapter 2 of Job, it happens again. Almost identical. Now, how many here remember the temptations of Jesus? Yeah, you got to memorize. <laughs> Satan tempted Jesus in three realms, didn't he? Lust of the flesh, the pride of, eyes, of the eyes, and the pride of life. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Amen? So when Satan came to Jesus, he says... If you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. What temptation is that? Lust of the flesh. He's hungry. You fasted 40 days and 40 nights. 
okay? But the second temptation, Satan takes him up into the pinnacle of a mountain. Not the temple this time, but the mountain. And he shows him all these kingdoms that are in the earth. He says, all these I'll give you if you bow down and you worship me. Where did he get those kingdoms? Adam gave them to him. Remember, Satan was in charge. He was in charge of the world in the Old Testament. God was just visiting. Now, this stuff, some of you might not have heard it before. And don't write me off at being weird. Go study. And then come, let's talk. There's things that have been held from you that you don't know will set you absolutely free. So Satan had this planet all the way up until Jesus came. In fact, the last 400 years before Matthew, nothing was written. There was no open. Between Malachi and Matthew, 400 years went by. Absolute silence. God was getting ready for Messiah to be born. Now remember, in the Old Testament, the same God that Jesus displayed of the Father in the New Testament was the same God in the Old Testament, but he dealt harshly with people because they had the nature of Satan in them and could stop the Messiah from being born. And if the Messiah, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, never got born, you and I would never be saved. So God had to protect the plan in the Old Testament over the people because people could turn on God at any moment. He had to protect the plan of the birth of the coming Messiah. Can you say amen? It's a beautiful, beautiful rescue plan. Not only that, but he came out of a woman. There was no sexual involvement, which means that there was no curse from Adam passed on to Jesus. His blood was absolutely pure. You want to hear about that? Go to my Christmas sermon and our New Year's Eve. We had a great time sharing that with you. All right, so, so Satan took Adam's birthright. All right, let's go to our point three. Everyone say point three. All right. Jesus gained it back. See, Jesus, if you read, he's called the last Adam. What do you mean? He finished the work that the first Adam failed at. Remember, God gave Adam dominion over the earth, right? And what didn't he do? He didn't keep the devil out of the garden. What aren't we doing? See, folks, a lot of times, I'm going to share this. It's going to make sense. A lot of times people fall down and get sick. You know, they get a little sick. Not because they caught something. It's because they're deficient in their vitamins. They're deficient. Something's deficient in their body. Sickness comes through different ways. It could be caught like a cold. Or you could be deficient like in B12 or something. You know, so God, you want to be with God, save that. Well, you could be deficient in your walking with God. You could know what the scripture says and, and you know, you're not quite living up to it. And you're going, God, I thank you for helping me. And that's all good. That's great. If you're two years old in the Lord, but if you're 10, 15 years old and you're still talking that way, somebody's got to grow up. Hello. Or the devil will be popping you everywhere you are. So you get emotional, get mad. You know, it's got to be this way. Remember something. God never pushes. He leads. So if you get stuff that has to be forced, it's not coming from God. Poke somebody and say, amen. Boy, am I giving you some stuff. Okay. So Jesus gained our authority back. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Look at the scriptures. Wonderful. 13 through 16. Okay. Colossians chapter 2. It's talking about us after Jesus died, after Jesus rose again, after Jesus finished the work. Then he placed that work inside of you and I, and he says, you follow me, don't follow your flesh, don't follow what people say, you follow me, and I will lead you and guide you, and I fulfill your life. Jesus said we should have life and have it more. How about now? Have you gotten to the abundance yet? I haven't, but I must say, since I started preaching these messages... In fact, you can go back in my history years ago, 40 some odd years ago when I first started. It's the same message. I've never changed my message. It's the same God, you see. But sometimes Christians will follow trends. What's, what's really big now is, you know, this. And when you do that, you sell out. God told you specifically, I love you. I got a calling for you. I want you to do this. He never changes his mind. He just builds on that. 
And if you got, you're jumping around trying to try new things and everything, you're deceived. Stop that. God's a master builder. He's not going to put one brick up over here and one brick down over here and, and kind of get your door half crooked. No, you are a living temple to God. And he's building you up from the inside. Say amen. And if I can get you exposed to God more and more and more, the faster he will build you up. Because it's not by just studying scripture. It's taking that study of scripture into the presence of God and allowing God to open our eyes. How many times have we read, God so loved the world that it gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? We go, oh, yeah, yeah. But if you look at God so loved the world, look at the love the father did by sending his son into this filthy planet to redeem his kids. Think about the love when it says that God had to come up with a new word to describe the love that described Jesus. It's called agape. That word never existed before Jesus because there wasn't any kind of description of love that meant unconditional There's one for you. But what you need to really understand is Jesus gained our authority back. So Colossians 2, look at verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. See, the Jews believed that you had to get circumcised to honor the covenant. Now, we're Gentiles. We're not Jews unless there's somebody that really is Jewish here. And so our job is to have a circumcision of the heart And not the flesh. Can you say amen? For it's not the cutting of the flesh that makes us holy. It's the condition of allowing God to be in our heart. So we are circumcised. When we say Jesus come into our heart, Jesus circumcised our heart and puts a seal on us. You belong to God. Next time the devil harasses you, you say, hey, you're going to harass me about my past. I'm going to tell you about your future. To hell you go. Hello? Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. And God's already put that curse on you, son. So guess what? Hands off of me. I belong to God. Hands off of me. I belong to God. Do you get up when the enemy starts harassing you? Hands off of me. I belong to God. God, he's trespassing. You learn to talk like that, man. He will leave you alone. He'll back off of you for a while. Oh, my. I get my face slapped every time I come around Carrie. Absolutely. You should be now able to tell when the enemy is working. And if not, pray and ask God to make you sensitive. Not hang around here for a while. We'll teach it. All right. So here we go. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, your past, present, and future sins are all covered under the blood. Well, does that license me to go out and sin? No, that's called your flesh, and that will get you in big trouble. But everything that you could think of doing wrong, God covered the whole thing and made you a child now. You're his child. If my child knocks over my coffee onto the rug, he doesn't stop being my child. (laughs) He's just out of fellowship. You guys got to lighten up a little bit. God doesn't throw us away. Once we accepted him, he doesn't throw us away unless you throw him away. And you're not going to be that stupid. So don't let the enemy, oh, the Lord has left you. Don't play those games in your head. That's where Satan works here. He can't get to your spirit. He works in your head by suggesting and coming against and, and, and saying what ifs and yeah buts. Hello, you know that. And he says, look, he forgave us all our trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting and the requirements that were against us and were contrary to us. That's the law of saying we're guilty to go to hell. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Jesus paid the price for you. You belong to Jesus. Okay, now here's the hard thing. How many here made Jesus your Lord? Come on, we need to confess that. That means he runs your life. But I guarantee he's not running your life. There's a lot of you still making choices for him. So what do I do? What do I do? Meet with him and say, God, 
Teach me how to let you prompt me in the choices I make. Teach me how to guide me so that they are solid choices, they're right choices. I mean, God can look into that engine of that car and tell you if it's going to last you or not. Hello? When I go shopping, I go shopping with God. And the last three vehicles he gave me are supernatural vehicles. Someday I'll get a chance to share that with you. One particular vehicle he gave me had over 750,000 miles and it never burned any oil. And that was one of those trucks you had when I first met you. A ranger. I called the ranger of faith. Yeah, I bought it and had it. Lots of miles on it because from my company, I bought it for 1200 bucks. I drove it and put another 500,000 miles on it and then gave it to somebody who drove it for another 250,000 miles and finally just gave it away. So when you give things to God, he protects them. He watches over them. But if you worry and you fret and you do all that, now it's under your power, under your authority. Would you rather be under God's or your authority? So I ask God to teach you how to get into his story. So let's get into this. All right, so gain, Jesus gained back all of our authority. He gained back our birthright. And well, how did he do that? Jesus had to be born in this planet. Remember I told you when we started that no one having been born here has any say here. Satan wasn't born here. So he really doesn't have any say. Jesus took that from him now. All Satan's got is a big bag of wind. Now, I want to tell you, you might want to argue with me, and I don't, I don't argue about anything. You want to say, this is, what, this is what it is. I look at him and say, isn't that amazing? You're arguing and I'm laughing. See, no, God doesn't argue. He doesn't force. I want to tell you, go back to Satan. You look at that, and you look at the whole way he operates, and it's, it's really weird. And so the way he operates is he tries to reason with us to get us to doubt but he says, look it, I wiped out all your hand, everything that's been accused against you, wiped it out of the way, disarmed now, listen, he says, I disarmed principalities, powers, and it made a public show of them openly. So if you say, now this is what people don't know, when you speak the name of Jesus out of your spirit, not off your head, so I can say, Jesus, Jesus, but I can say, Jesus, and bring it out of my spirit. That's where God lives. You bring your voice, your words out. Can you say amen? And when you do that, we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. It's made unto salvation. For with the heart, man believes unto the righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto wholeness, healing, soundness, and deliverance. Say amen. So he goes. And he says he made a public show of the devil. So Satan's entire supernatural equipment is now on a dysfunctional basis. Satan can't show up in your living room, can't scare the snot out of you, and then leave at any time he wants. Hello? You have to look for the enemy for him to show up. Take a look at all those ghost shows that they were on the TV for the longest time. You ever wonder what happened to them all? They all got the devil on them. Because you go looking for the devil, what are you going to find? Yeah, you're going to find the devil, man. I remember deliverance ministries, people casting out of devils out of everything, you know, and literally talked about the devil so much, they functioned about the devil so much, they literally brought the devil to come visit. And they end up losing their families and everything because they don't realize where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I in the midst of them. Two or three are gathered talking about the devil too much. He shows up to listen about himself. Gosh sakes, that's how it works. So we don't pay attention to him. He's been stripped. Say amen. Once in a while, you'll hear him suggest. But you know already. And if you don't, You'll know this, that every thought that comes into your mind that is not very good, don't say anything. It will die unborn by not talking about it. 
good thoughts come into your mind. Say, oh, Lord's good, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But he'll, he'll throw that. He says, do you remember what you did in the past? How dare you think you can fellowship with these lovely people when you were this kind of person? And, and then if you start speaking that, now it becomes an imagination. Let me ask you, can you see yourself walking with God? It's a, is it a brighter picture than the way you used to be in your past? And if it is, wonderful. We're to forget our past and press on to the full mark of God. Can you say amen? All right. So say, I have my authority back and I'm born again and I have God's authority in me. Amen. So we know that Jesus had to be born in the earth. He was born of a woman, so he exited out of fallen and cursed blood. And it was the seed of a woman that would smash Satan's. And so he lived 33 years. Let me ask you this one. This one's a, a toughie for a lot of people, but it's not really. Was Jesus, when he was a baby, was Jesus God? Yeah. Did Jesus, did Jesus know everything? No. Nope. He had to learn. The Bible says he had to learn and to grow to know. Yes, he was God, but he had to grow to learn. Hello, read about it. I'm not trying to lie to you. I'm just telling you, he, he could have fell. He could have not completed his assignment, and we wouldn't have any salvation. It says at all points he was tempted, yes, without sin, though. Hello? And so the neat thing about it is, is he restored us. Now, the devil doesn't want you to know that. Hello. So what did Jesus do? He turned the victory over the people that are still in the planet. Who's that? You guys. A born again believer has authority, but they need to find out how it works. All right. Now, do you believe let me use some examples and I'm almost done with you. If I'm preaching the word, if somebody got up and started prophesying the same time I'm preaching the word, is that in order? No. What's out of order with that? God does not interrupt God. See, I get up in this pulpit, I don't want to stand as carry, I want to stand as a representative of God. So if I'm preaching the oracles of God and somebody stands up and says, Thus saith the Lord, what do we have? Confusion. It's not of God. Okay. Everyone say, usurp authority. Don't usurp authority. Do you know what usurping authority is? It's when you go into somebody's house and help yourself to the fridge. No respect to the people's house. You usurped authority. The idea might be good. I'm hungry. But why don't you ask? And so if we're not careful. We assert authority. And we do that sometimes daily by taking our own life in our hands and making choices that God should be helping us with. And we're usurping God's authority. So what happens? Nothing else works. You have fused yourself from the power. In order to have God's power, you have to be submitted to God. You have to go to God so God's power can function through you. You don't use magic words or wave a magic Bible. No, you go to God and you submit to God and you get under his authority and you do that on a daily basis. And then God says, I will give you my authority. John 1.12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave authority to be to the children of God. So once we learn to be under God's authority... You're not going to have any problem laying hands on the sick and seeing them recover. Because it's God, you, you hooked up with God, and it's his power flowing through your hands. Hello? Because you're submitted to God. But what happens is we're not submitted to God. We don't pray in the morning. We don't do what we're supposed to be doing. And then when our need arises and we need to cast the devil out of something, or really need to take authority, we're severed from the authority that the devil's afraid of. He's afraid of God in you. He's afraid of you being subjected and submitted to God. When you find somebody that is, you can see that God is really manifested in their life. Because they're 
operating under God's authority. Say amen. amen. And then they're able to take God's authority because the Bible calls us ambassadors and use God's authority because it's God's authority, not ours. So here, I, I teach a lot of people on spiritual warfare. First thing in our hearts that Satan is afraid of is he's afraid of you being able to release God. He knows who you are. He helped raise you. I'm not talking about him himself, but every child has good and evil working on them until they reach accountability and whatever they lean to. Come on now. And what happens is the enemy puts these little triggers in there. The only way we can get away from those is by meeting with God and let God bring us out of ourselves and into new, newness of life. Amen. All right, so here's one thing God will never do. God will never tell you something that's going to evolve. Let's, for example, let's say I come to Scott. I'm a love, I love using Scott. And they say, Scott wants you to sell your business, sell your dogs, and move to Alaska. God told me. First of all, if God didn't tell him, I just usurped his authority. And I completely miss God. God will never tell you something that involves other people without telling them to. Hello? Don't look up me in that tone of voice. See, God's never going to say, move to Alaska if he hadn't told you first. God's words spoken to people and confirmed to people only confirm what God chooses to speak to you personally. Hello? And so let me just tell you this. Don't get mad at me. But everything that goes on in the church, every part of the vision, everything that we're going to ever do fits underneath the vision of the church. Have you read it? And if not, get a chance to read it. There's great room for you to be creative in all that things. But let you know, you can't usurp the pastor's authority. You might have a wonderful idea, but if you don't come into the house and sit down and say, you know, I'm hungry. Can I have a sandwich? Instead, you run to the fridge and you grab it and say, God told me. You're out of order, you see. So let's look at a scripture that actually says that, and then we can call it a day, all right? Go with me to Acts chapter uh, 10. Actually, let's go, let's go to Luke chapter 7, 1 through 10. Okay, now this is about Peter. We, Peter is a Jew, so wonderful. But Jewish people were told to don't eat anything unclean. And the reason why they were told that is there was a lot of venereal diseases and a lot of diseases that God couldn't protect them from. That if they ate from the mollusks in the warm waters and stuff, they could kill themselves. And of course, that's Satan's plan for all the Jewish people to die. Okay, so Messiah can't get born. So they had all these things they had to follow and kind of instruct. So when we see the Jewish mindset, you need to understand. Now, there's this fella, uh, Peter, who does not deal with Gentiles. He doesn't fellowship with Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. So he wouldn't have any company with me because he's a Jew. Sad, but that's just the way they were. And now God's, they're not that way anymore. But, you know, so that's just the way God did it. So here's a, here's a man who's a Gentile. But he was a faithful man. He prayed a lot. He gave money. And God showed up and told him, I want you to go to a place, and uh, to a, a house, and you'll see a man named Simon who's a tanner. There's a man named Peter there, and he's going to see you coming in a vision. See? And he's going he gonna to see you coming in a vision. And it says, and then he's going to go with you and he's going to share. Okay. What I'm saying is there were three major people involved in this incident. All three were told by God what was going to happen. So let, let me try to read through this real quick. Okay. There was, as he entered a Capernaum and a certain centurion servant, he was Italian, who was uh, dear to him, was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard about Jesus, he sent elders to, to the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him 
earnestly saying that one out to whom he should do this was deserving. See, Jews always believe in works. And for he loves our nation and has built a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he had, was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying, to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am a not worthy that you should what? Come under my roof. See, he, this centurion understood, understood that in order for you to come under somebody's roof, you're subject to them. He says, I'm not worthy. You're being a Jew. I'm not worthy to even come under your roof, but you just speak the word only. So we're going to see this. So Jesus is willing to come because he doesn't know any Jew or any difference. We're all the same. He loves us. Because therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am, now listen, I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. So here's this man saying, I tell certain people to do this and they do this. And certain people tell me what to do, and I do that. What is that telling us? That's telling us in order for us to use power, we have to submit to power. In order for us to use power, we have to use it correctly. Say amen. Now, if I tell you there's a police, office up, a police officer up there from the city, he's directing traffic today. One day we'll have that, you know, so many people leaving. And, you know, and he's directing traffic. Now, can he physically stop a car? No, he can't. But he's been given authority there where he could stop cars and he can tell cars to go. Do you understand? So we can't physically stop the devil. But the authority that you and I have that we get from God every day as he floods us with it has the authority to tell the devil what to do and how to move circumstances. Hello? You guys have been experiencing miracles in our presence by opening up and allowing God and submitting to God for him to do that. Can you say amen? So here's a centurion. So look, Jesus, I got it. You're submitted to your father. You have the authority to just speak the word. I'm unworthy to come under for you to come under my roof, but you just speak the word over. And I understand that when I follow orders... And those orders get done, it's good. And then I also give orders as the, the instructions are for other people, and it's done. So if we don't follow our God and submit to our God, how can we expect to represent our God? You want to know why the church of Jesus Christ doesn't have much power? It, it will get more power because they have not been for at least 20 years submitted to God. Now, certain pockets of them have been. But the church got off of the revival that was happening. TBN, CBN, all these great things that were going on. Instead of bringing up new people, we got to fighting amongst ourselves as a church. And you know that somebody up the street will criticize the church down the street. That's how you become powerless. We submit to God, rather. We get our marching orders. And then we just follow it through the, in the day. Can you say amen? How many know they've got a beautiful toaster oven out here? But if we don't plug it in, it's not going to toast. If you're a beautiful person, and I know you are, if you don't submit to God on a daily basis and allow him to clean you up and build you up from the inside out, then you're going to periodically unplug and not be able to toast. Amen. And if you like that feeling of zip dingle, then that's okay. But listen, I'd rather have you successful. I'd rather have you lay hands on people that get healed. We have cancer patients healed here. People with gross stuff gone. You know, I mean, everything down to hangnails. God wants to take good care of you. But if you're not submitted to him and not plugged in, you're not doing what you're supposed to do, it's just not going to work. It can't work any other way. I'd love to put water in my car. Unless I have a hydrogen changer, I, it's not going to work. Nowadays, with the price of water, who knows? <laughs> 
It doesn't work that way. You're made to run on God. And you're made to be with God. And let him make you the most beautiful child you could ever be. Remember, you individually are his favorite. Think of that. God is no respecter of persons. So he treats all people alike. So you are his favorite. Talk to him personally. Commute to him personally. You'll find your life taking on so much more richness and fullness. Did you get something out of that this morning? Give the Lord a praise, huh?